Father Joseph, Father Michael, Father David, the grace, mercy, and forbearance of our holy triune, triune God has permitted us to be together again in the neighborhood of the Lord's baptizer and forerunner, St. John. We would also like to thank our beloved abbots and the sisters for sponsoring this yearly event. The abbots and the senior sisters are on their way to pray at the enthronement of our new Greek metropolitan Gerasimus tomorrow. And we pray that God gives him the power to speak the word of his truth. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the truth is a person. The truth is our Lord Jesus Christ. And his truth is only revealed in his true body, the Orthodox Church, the Church of the Prophets and Apostles and Saints, and those who fear the Lord. In our church tradition, in our church written tradition, rather, because in the church we have the tradition, and out of that tradition we have the written tradition, which is the Holy Scriptures, and we have the oral, the oral tradition. We see and distinguish three categories of Christians, prophets, saints, and those who fear the Lord, the name of the Lord. And the Lord is coming to, keep, to give the prize to his servants. And his servants are the prophets. And in this category, prophets, we also include the apostles, the saints and martyrs. And the third category, all of us who fear the name of the Lord. My brothers in Christ, sometimes we can have thoughts of despair. Do we all have to be missionaries and apostles? But we can't. We have families. We have occupations. Do we all have to be saints? The Protestants tell us that we are all saints. How can we be in the uncreated light? Is that asked of us? The very consoling book of the Revelation tells us, and this is in the 11th chapter, that the Lord is coming to give a prize not only to the prophets and apostles, not only to his saints and martyrs, but all of us who fear his name. All of us who are willing to struggle, to take on the fight, and all of us who wish to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. And this fear and trembling does not pertain to the Lord. We don't need to fear and tremble because of the Lord. We need to fear and tremble about our weaknesses so we don't fall, so we don't deny him. This is the fear and trembling that St. Paul is talking about. Not to succumb to pride. And we need to work out our salvation in holy obedience to our mother church to the ark of salvation. The Lord is coming soon. A number of signs, and we have two very strong ones. Two signs by the beginning of this summer, an RFID chip 
will be on all American passports. We'll have a digital picture and all the information will be on the passport. And this information can be made available from 50 to 100 feet away. And of course, from farther away too. But another very powerful sign, according to St. Hieronymus, is the sin of homosexuality. Hieronymus says, one of our early church fathers, that when you see that the sin of homosexuality is inundating the sidewalks, the end is near. Because we have the historical prerequisite of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the only sin, according to the church fathers, that makes the angels hide their faces. So the arena of the church has been open for us. According to our hymnography, the arena of the church is open the whole year, the whole year long, but especially during this very special season, the Triodion season. And our hymnology says, let all who wish to compete for the prize now enter. So we are prize contenders. The church is calling us out to win a prize. And the church says, gird yourselves with the noble struggle of the fast. Use prayer as a breastplate, almsgiving as a helmet. And instead of a sword, Use the fast which slices all evil from the heart. And this is the first tone of Cheese Fair Sunday. So the church here is alluding to spiritual warfare. In a service of our holy baptism, we are called soldiers of Christ. And another hymn in Triodion in this very beautiful season, it states... Let us set, set out with joy upon the season of the fast and prepare ourselves for spiritual combat, battle. And St. Paul tells us along these lines in Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. And the weapons of the evil one are very many. But some of his top guns, according to the church fathers, are three. The first one is ignorance. Agonia in Greek. To be agnostic of the will of God. To be agnostic of the church to be totally clueless. And in the Old Testament, Prophet Amos, or the Holy Spirit, rather, through Prophet Amos says, my people are lost due to lack of, of knowledge. So not knowing how to fight, not knowing how to do battle, it lessens our chances of any success at all. The second weapon of the evil one is oblivion, forgetfulness. To forget our calling, to forget our real purpose in this life, which is the acquisition of the Holy Spirit and not the acquisition of some temporary happiness and some temporary materials. We often forget that the bridegroom is coming in the middle of the night. And that could be tonight for any one of us. So during this very special period, the church is nudging us. Wake up, wake up, sipna. And the third, the third and very difficult weapon 
to struggle against is spiritual anorexia. Just like physical anorexia can kill someone, this is especially true for the soul. Spiritual laziness, another term is akivia. This anorexia about spiritual things. And how do we get to this point? The Lord tells us in, Saint, in the Gospel of St. Luke, be watchful, be aware, lest your hearts become weighed down with what? With carousing, trips at expensive hotels, nightclubs, parties, vacationing, carousing, drunkenness, and not necessarily from wine. We can be drunk with success. We can be drunk with a computer. We can be drunk in a Greek restaurant, working 18 hours a day, and not, have, not touch a sip of wine. So carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. Cares of this life. And all these things weigh down the soul and take us away from our God-given purpose. So the weapons of the devil are many, but the weapons provided by our church and our Lord Jesus Christ are also very many. And the greatest weapon against the devil is the formidable sign of the cross. And the cross does not help us at all if we just have it hanging around our neck. It's a nice jewel if we don't believe on the one, in the one who was crucified for us on that cross. When we live the gospel of the cross, when we glory in the cross of Christ, the cross is our fortress. The Christian is a crucified being. We are crucified along with Christ. Our hymnology will tell us all through Holy Week. And St. Paul, in his mystical theology, he speaks about putting to death our earthly members, putting to death our carnal mindset, so this is a general weapon, but we also have some other weapons specified by the church fathers, a trio, the trio of fasting, vigil, and prayer, which gives us, which give us gifts of the Holy Spirit. Fasting, vigil, staying up at night and praying, Staying up at night, being awake, watchfulness rather, and prayer. And St. Paul also introduces us to some other tactical weapons in 2 Corinthians 6 chapter. Let us commend ourselves as servants of God with the weapons of righteousness, those of the right hand and those of the left hand. And according to Hesychius, the presbyter, in the Philokalia, he explains this, that the offensive weapons are humility and prayer. Someone would think humility is a very defensive weapon. But we'll explain why humility is really an offensive weapon. These are the offensive weapons and the defensive weapons are watchfulness and rebuttal or debate. Humility burns the devil. In the readings of the church fathers, 
in a desert, we have a young lady who was demon-possessed, and she's visiting priests and exorcisms, and the demon does not leave. But uh, I believe she visits St. Anthony, and he sends her to St. Paul, the simple, who was one of his disciples. And when this demon-possessed person got next to St. Paul, the energy of the de demon basically swung the person's hand and smacked the saint on the one cheek, and instantly he turned the other cheek, and the demon starts shrieking, you are burning me. And this is an offensive weapon. It burns the devil. In the life of another contemporary saint of Greece named Papulakos, a wonderful story who's uh, equivalent to Saint Cosmas the Aetolian, but he was in Peloponnese around 1830. There's an incident where he just became a monk, and I don't want to go into the whole story, it'll take too long, but uh, he had a great vision, and he gave, uh, he was a partner with his brothers, and at the age of 45, he leaves the world, and he's walking towards the mountains to build a chapel. And along the way, he stopped to rest, and someone is running towards him, and he's his name is Michael, and he says, Hi, how are you? Where are you coming from? I just murdered my wife. It was a murder. And he tried to explain to him that uh, God loves everyone. We can all repent. Began to talk to him. But this man was thinking about food because he was starved. He didn't eat for three days. He was running from the authorities. So, he really wanted to rob him because he needed money, but he was waiting for him to sleep first. So he ate all his food, the little olives and a little bit of bread he had in his little sack. And then after he laid down to sleep a little bit, this man made Michael. He opened his pocketbook and he began to look through, kind of looking for money, trying to take it. So he wakes up. The holy elder wakes up, and like he was seeing the most natural thing, he tells him, oh, my brother, please forgive me. Really, I never asked you, how could I do this? I never asked you if you needed any money. And this man who was ready to kill him, to take his money like a man, he didn't want to steal it, he wanted to do it the right way like a criminal. At this point, he was taken back, knocked him right back, and he just says, what well, do you care if I need money or not? Couldn't believe it. He says, we're brothers. You're my brother. And he followed him and he became a monastic, his first monk. <laughs> the power of practice Christianity but you see, we're ready to seek our rights. We have rights. And the first thing we have to learn as Christians, at some point we have to learn that we have to give up our rights. We have to give up our rights. And then we'll have the Lord give us his grace. So we have humility, a great weapon, we have prayer, also another great weapon that we'll talk about more in tomorrow's session, especially the little prayer that you know very well, the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And that has different variations, but this is the one that is practiced in most of our monastic communities here and in the Holy Mountain. So we also have prayer was an offensive weapon, and prayer does burn the devil and brings the grace of God. 
A defensive weapon is watchfulness, to watch our senses, to watch our senses, to watch our eyes, our ears, to watch where we walk. And I know we fast, but fasting from food is the beginning. That's the start. This fasting of the eyes, these televisions need to be turned off. If we need to fight the good fight, we need to turn the computer off. We have, we have some weaknesses that get us glued on the screen, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We need to watch when we're walking. We've got to watch for these intruders coming in because we can see something now and 10 years later the devil can bring it to us during prayer. We all know that very well. And when the Lord told Adam, when the Lord told Adam in the Garden of Eden, watch the garden, watch from what? From lions, from tigers, they were all tame. They were all beating into Adam. Watch your heart. Watch your noose. Watch yourself. Just like Tobit, Tobit in the Old Testament told his son Tobias, watch yourself, my son, from all forms of fornication. From the mind, from the eyes, from all forms. So this watchfulness is extremely important, especially for all our senses, and we have to watch the sixth sense, the imagination. Another defensive weapon is debate or contradiction. And this weapon was used by Christ where he began to answer the devil back when he offered him those three temptations that every Christian will run into even before his teenage years. Those three big enemies of our soul. The first one is philidonia, philos, you know that word by now. And you know the word hedonism, hedonistic, from the Greek word idoni, to be a lover of pleasure. Philargeria, the love of gold, the love of silver, the love of material goods. And the third one is philo. Voxia, you know the word voxa, glory, the love of vain glory. So these three are the heads of all passions, and these are what the devil threw to Christ our Lord. And in the first one, when he told him, tell all these stones in Greek to become bread. Why, wasn't it? one stone enough for him to but he wanted to tempt him so it's nice when we when we see our refrigerator being full we get some pleasure out of that when we have a lot of things we fulfill our hedonistic pleasure just by looking at these things So Christ says, man does not live with bread alone. It's a rebuttal. When the second temptation, he says, fall down and worship me, and I will give you all these kingdoms that you see on this panoramic view. He says, it is written, worship the Lord your God alone. And on the third one, when he told him, to fall down so they would be declaring the Messiah, see what the devil was doing. He was trying to tempt him to be declare the Messiah by the people that were watching all this 
so he wouldn't have to go on the cross. And the Lord says, get behind me, Satan. <clears throat> so based on what we've said so far, based on what we said, we see that our church has all the methodology to combat the schemes of the evil one. And we become successful fighters when we develop the mind of the church, which is the mind of Christ. St. Paul says, copy me as I copy Christ. If it's too difficult for you, if you think it's too difficult for you to copy Christ, then copy me. And the monks, it's too difficult for them. How can I do this? How can I be Christ-like? Then copy your spiritual father for now. That'll be enough. You see, That's feasible. Now, by the way, when we say all these things, let's not get the notion that we must be infallible. O only the Pope is infallible. <laughs> okay? Let's not think that, you know, we're going to be flawless anytime soon. We must swallow the fact that we will always be weak. We will always be weaklings. We'll be sinful. We will be full of weaknesses, and that's okay. We will be prone to fall at any given time. Giants have fallen. The essence of the spiritual life is for men to find out how to repent, not how to do great works, because our works do not save us. Our repentance saves us because repentance goes together with humility and humility brings the grace of God and the mercy of God. The Pharisee was full of good works. He was blameless. He was flawless. I tithe. I go to church. I do everything right. You owe me. See? We get the idea that God owes us because we come to church, we light a candle. Because we learn to depend on our works. You see. We do a few works and we think that God owes us something. Same thing with a young lawyer. Lord, what must I what must I do to be saved? Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Well, I kept them all. What else? What else? Well, sell everything you have. He couldn't do that. So the man who constantly repents overcomes his falls constantly. The man who constantly repents, and many times God does not allow us any special gifts, and the vision of the uncreated light. And I know a lot of the converts right away, a few months later, we want to see a little bit of light. <laughs> and it's natural. But if God does that, he'll destroy us instantly. It is better for us to allow us, better to allow us to fall so he can keep us repenting, keep us safe, keep us very close to the ground, the one who's very close, the one who's grounded, will not get electrocuted, will not be zapped. You need to be grounded well. So no, no matter how we advance, how much we advance, no, no matter how much, how spiritual we get, we will be falling. And if we know this, we will not be crushed. We have people saying, oh my God, I did this sin. I can't believe it. And they go for weeks torturing themselves over a sin. You confess it, it's gone. So what I'm trying to say is we must not be terrified when we sin. When we lose our temper again and again. 
Why don't we gossip? Why don't we judge? Unfortunately, sin is something very close to us. Now, we don't mean, we don't say this to justify our weaknesses and our bad actions. We say this so that we don't become full of anxiety, we don't despair, and we lose this joy that we're supposed to have as Christians. Some of our Christians, some of us Christians, are some of the most miserable people because we don't know this struggle. So we fall, but we get up. We fall and we get up again. But sin is offered in a multi-level marketing system from the evil one, as we'll see. And we need to know how to defend against the different states and stages of sin that we'll discuss in later sessions. So sin will be along with us, even in church, right in church, even in the altar. In one of the hymns, and these hymns are written by monks, mostly. In one of the hymns, the, melo the melodist is writing that, I'm here at the, at the chanter's stand, and as I'm singing at the same time, I am sinning inside. I sing and I do the sin at the same time. How? By my imagination. Our imagination travels to all kinds of past experiences. So in the journey, in the path of the spiritual struggle, there are very many keys that we need to know. And we need to know them well, because if we don't know these key, keys, if we don't know how to use them, there are chances that the enemy the enemy of our salvation will close us in, will lock us in. He will lock us in imaginary dungeons with inexistent fears that will not allow us to taste and enjoy the peace of our soul, the peace promised by our Christ. And people suffer for years because of shadows, because of inexistent problems, spy, spider webs. And today, we must say that we live in an era of oversensitivity. People are overly sensitive today. And the devil knows this. And right before Holy Communion, he'll stir something up. One of the child will begin to kick. One of the, the two of the children will be fighting. And then, you know, we lose our, our temper a little bit. And then we stay away from the cup because we're oversensitive. This oversensitivity is also another weapon that's used against us. So we have to be very careful against these thoughts that come in, which are called loyismi in Greek. I heard the word uh, in the Akathist, uh, the logicians of Athens. <laughs> it's a very nice word. We get this same word from there. The logicians were constantly thinking, you know. It's uh, the same root. And we have these intruders that are coming in, and this is how the enemy begins his attack. The attack begins from thoughts. And these thoughts can take psychopathic dimensions, as you know. It can be persistent thoughts. A young man became obsessed with the studying of the Antichrist. And at some point, the evil one was whispering to him that he might be the Antichrist. This is in Greece now. And he tells some of his friends, and how oh, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? He goes to some priests, 
And they said, oh, no, my son, don't worry about it. You're not the Antichrist. Come on. Get out of here. Well, this thought would not go away. And this poor thing ended up in the Holy Mountain, and he talked to one of the elders that we know very well. He was outside, and he tells the monks, tell the elder that I'm the Antichrist, and I'm here to see him. <laughs> the monks go inside. <laughs> so, so, elder, the Antichrist is outside, and he wants to see you. <laughs> Now we're, we're laughing now, but this is very tragic for that person. So he walks inside, and the elder is very comical. And he says, the, the monk, tell this bufo, it's very, very funny when you, and bufo in Greek is a daughter bird. Okay. Tell this bufo to come in. And he walks in, he sits down, he says, elder, I am the Antichrist. And the elder goes, Are Bufo, you daughter bird, you are the Antichrist? Yes, I'm the Antichrist. Look, Bufo, the Antichrist will be Jewish. Are you Jewish? No, I'm Greek. You mean I'm not the Antichrist? No, Are Bufo, you're not the Antichrist. Whew. <laughs> That's all it took. <laughs> These thoughts are real for some people, believe it or not. Another person went to Elder Paisios, and he goes, Elder, for months now I have a little bird in my ear, and it's chirping, and I tell people and nobody will believe me. Nobody will believe me. <coughs> I tell my family, they laugh at me. I went to confession, they laugh at me. But I hear this bird, and it's not coming out. And he goes, let me see, let me take a look. Very serious now. He takes a look. There's a couple other people around, and they were trying to keep him laughing. You know, he motioned to them. And he says, by golly, I see it. It's inside your ear. Hold on a second. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me open your ear. Close your eyes. He goes in, makes a movement. He goes, I got it. Flew away. I told them they wouldn't believe me. I feel so much better. <laughs> and another one went in who thought that his one ear was longer than the other, and he lost sleep over this for many months. <laughs> and he said, Elder, you know, I'm miserable. I don't know what to do. I have a problem. What's your problem? My one ear is longer than the other. It's hanging lower. And he goes inside. He goes, hold, don't move. Hold. He goes inside. <laughs> it was very funny. He goes in. He takes a measuring tape, very seriously. He goes in. He brings the tape. Stand still. Measures. Well, I see it. It is a little lower. Okay, hold on now. Don't move. He takes the ear, pulls it down. He goes, oh, I pulled it too much. Hold on now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pull the other one up a little bit higher. You're fine now. I mean, I told him they wouldn't believe me. And then he starts speaking spiritually, gave him a rule, and this man was fine. So these are... Of course, it's, we can laugh about these things, but one of these topics, this is one of these topics that's extremely essential in our spiritual struggle, and it's the correct dealing with our daily thoughts. And I know that you know most of these things, but you may want to also help some people out there, because people suffer from this. And this especially to people who are prone to oversensitivity and the inability to deal with these thoughts often hinders people spiritually. It brings unnecessary confusion, anxiety, stress, 
And all this can be avoided by practicing the teachings of our church fathers. They spell these things out to us loud and clear. And many people at the beginning of their spiritual journey get so much bombarded by these logismi that a lot of people give up the struggle. So what are these things called logismi in Greek? They're not just simple thoughts. You know, according to a university, and I, I don't know how they came up with this, they state that on a daily basis, in a 16-hour period, we have about 4,000 different thoughts, simple thoughts. Now, we have two different words in Greek. You know, for thoughts, we may have more than two, three words. I believe the Greek language is about 5 million or 6 million words as compared to about 800,000 of the English language. So, a logismos is a charged thought. It has energy. It's not a skepsis in Greek where we get the word skeptical from the word skepsis, which is a simple thought. But logismos is this thing that the logicians do. You know, they sit there and meditate on things. So, this charged thought is the vehicle that transmits spiritual energy. And this energy can be good, it can be bad, or it can be indifferent. It's like having a hypothermic needle in the case of valoyismo, and you kind of introduce some fluid in your blood. And if it's medicine, it would benefit. But if it's some kind of a toxin, then it would become very ill. And if it's poisonous, we become ultimately lifeless. So these e-thoughts, these energy charged thoughts, have three origins. The Protestants think that they're all from God, you know? God is speaking to me constantly. God is telling me this, God is telling me this, that. And a few weeks ago when I was in LA, I spoke to a person that unfortunately came into the Orthodox Church without exorcisms and she was already deluded, she was already deceived by a demonic spirit when she was Catholic. God has been, had been speaking to her even before, but this was not caught because exorcisms were missed. I don't want to say more than that. spent two and a half years in saying, I'm not supposed to say the city, uh, in this city, in this church, and this was not caught. I spoke to her at length when I saw the invitation to a supper with a lamb. This demonic spirit whom she believed 100% was telling her for nine months that Christ is coming back in March 13 with 20, 24 elders. She sold everything she had. She borrowed money from her boss. She rented a whole hotel with 200 dinners, sent it out invitations. And this in an orthodox setting. I tried to call back, but there was no answer after the 13th. And, and an earthquake was supposed to level the city. But you see, in this delusion, if there's going to be an earthquake, how are you going to have 200 people come to this meal? 
Only 20 people responded from the Orthodox Church. Can you imagine that? And another 20 from other denominations. So these are ways that the devil fights us. It starts with a thought. So not all thoughts are from God. Some thoughts are from God. My confessor back home, Father Nicholas, about 11 o'clock at night, he had a persistent thought. 11.30 at night, his presbytera, his wife is saying, what is wrong with you? This is no time to call one, someone. It's no time to call somebody. I have to call this person. And he fought this for a few minutes. And he calls him at 11.30. Father Nicholas, it's you? Yes, doctor, how are you? Oh, thank God you're calling. I was just ready to inject myself with a hypothermic needle. I was ready to finish it all. He fell in love with a nurse. And she took off with someone else. And he was going to end it all. So our merciful God put this holy thought in my confessor to call him up. And he ran over there and straightened him out and he's very happy somewhere in California these days. So some thoughts are from God. Some thoughts are from ourself. And some thoughts are from the devil, from Satan. In tonight's, I don't know, was in, uh, I believe, last week's, you heard in salutation, floods of doubtful thoughts inundated the wise Joseph after his betrothed Virgin Mary came back from Elizabeth. He saw a change in her figure. And doubts flooded him. And if you see the icon of the nativity, the devil is there with some kind of a coat, and he has a staff. And Joseph is sitting down like this in deep thought. And the devil is telling him, if this staff can grow leaves and have, and have fruit, then a virgin can give birth without a man. And Joseph sure had a few sleepless nights until the angel told him, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So these thoughts and our inability to cope with them are responsible for truckloads of Valium outside of the church and even for some of us orthodox inside the church. Our church is a hospital. And without our Orthodox tradition of the church fathers, Orthodox churches, they may be called Orthodox, but without this tradition, they cannot offer any help. It's like having a very nice hospital that has nice clean beds, nice carpeted halls, nice relaxing music, but instead of doctors, you have some massage therapists. And people go in and they get a little comfort, but when they get ill, this is no, this is, this is not the place to go. As a teenager, I was attending a very ideal Orthodox parish. Very well organized, very mission oriented, wonderful in area of philanthropy, a lot of activities, and so on. However, much like many other parishes in those days, what was lacking was the emphasis on traditional Orthodox discipline and spirituality. Much emphasis was placed on youth programs, sports, lock-ins, dances, which may not be bad in themselves for that age group. However, 
they do very little to prepare a young person spiritually. Although I'm not blaming anyone for what I'm about to say, I must admit that what attracted me to the church at the time, uh, other than you know my mother pushing me to go, was not the need for the salvation of my soul. Again, please don't misunderstand. You can have very spiritual and traditional priests at a parish, uh, a lot of emphasis on spirituality, and it may not guarantee that every soul will respond. It is really a mystery when and how a soul opens itself to God. Nevertheless, confession was on a very back burner, just like in many parishes today in this country, and I'm sure in your country as well. Nothing much was ever mentioned about confession, about the need for a spiritual father, about monasticism, and I think I was about 24, 25 years old when I finally heard something about Mount Athos. One of my friends who attended this parish, we lifted weights together after school, uh, during high school, the high school years. He left during my college years and went to Mount Athos. Again, this proves that we cannot blame the parish or the environment. God searches out his own in spite of our weaknesses. On the other hand, however, a very traditional, well-focused, orthodox spiritual environment can have a great influence on the souls of the teenagers. Once again, and again, we're not criticizing anybody. This is how these people were taught. We went to Sunday school, and I just had come from Greece. I was 14 years old at the time. I spoke very little English as it was, and all I heard was contemporary issues and politics, and, you know, they talked about baseball and football, and all I cared about was soccer at the time, so, you know, I wasn't too interested. But at any rate, we had a very nice, closely knit Greek Goya group. We stuck together. And I was about 19 years old until one night, one of my friends who was engaged to my second cousin was out bowling. I couldn't go because I was in college at the time. It was my first year in college. And uh, I had to a lot of exams that weekend. So I stayed home in my room and uh, that night, Angelo fell over and died. He had a congenital tumor. And at the time, you know, I did not feel the impact. I had no place to go. Didn't want to say anything to my mother. It was so, weak. so I kept it all inside. Three nights later after the funeral, I'm studying and all of a sudden, I begin to hyperventilate. I have no idea what this is. You know, my heart is racing, pumping. Of course, I was very scared. I had no one to talk to, not a confessor, not a spiritual friend, nothing at all. Went out of the house, went to a friend's diner, and for the next two months, I could not sleep in my bed. I would study, and after that, I would leave, go to a diner, and stay up all night, and sleep a few hours during the day. I would hyperventilate, having no one to talk to, in this ideal orthodox setting. So finally, two months later, I admitted myself to the hospital, and a doctor, I told him what was going on, and he realized right away that it was anxiety. Gave me a little bit of Valium, and you know, a week later it was much better. But for about a year, I could not sleep in my bed. And I moved out of the house. I didn't want to, but 
I stayed with some friends at an apartment next to my college, and after a year, it went away. This is what happens when we're outside of the church. This is how people suffer, and no one knows it. My family knows nothing about this to this day. No one. And I have at least 10 siblings. Of course, I wouldn't tell my mother. I wouldn't want her to worry. No. I'd still do that. I still do that to this day. <laughs> she worries when I fly. So I know that she calls me once a week. So I will call her a day before I leave. <laughs> so most of the time, you know, she doesn't know when I'm away. And then when I get back, you know, she catches me sometimes on the cell phone. On a more serious note, of course, I feel very fortunate that by the grace of God, I overcame this ordeal, even at the absence of an experienced spiritual father. Unfortunately, these persisting loyismi thoughts can often take tragic dimensions, even for baptized Orthodox Christians, especially if they are not very well grounded with the mysteries of the church. A husband from Cyprus, for example, had this persistent and very tyrannical thought that his wife was unfaithful to him. He kept this inside and it turned his life into, a, into true torture. A few months later, he wrote a note to his beloved wife. The note said, My life without you has no meaning whatsoever. I have nothing to live for. And after placing this note on their bed, he committed suicide. He succumbed to the demonic logismo of depression and despair. What is really sad about this whole situation is the fact that his poor wife was clueless. She was totally innocent. Her confession was heard by uh, Metropolitan Athanasius of Limassol, who relayed this story to us. Needless to say, despair and depression are very powerful weapons of the devil. And the inability to deal with these loyismi sends many people to the grave and worse yet to a possible a permanent separation from God. During the early 90s, really 1994, a severe famine claimed thousands of lives in Sudan, in Africa. Kevin Carter was one of the Western photographers present in that area. One of his photographs made him the Pulitzer Prize winner in 1994. His photograph, which shot the entire world and still floats around on the internet, depicted a semi-dying skin and bone small child overcome by exhaustion. This child was left behind not being able to keep up with the thousands of people who were heading toward the United Nations relief camps. The poor and exhausted child was hunched over on the ground and a few feet behind it was a vulture waiting for the child to die so that it could eat it. No one knows what happened to this poor child, including the photographer Kevin Carter, who was stricken with grief. This poor man, who did not understand the spiritual weapons of the evil one, succumbed to the logismi of possibly oversensitivity and helplessness. He committed suicide three months after this, photograph, this photograph made him a world-famous photographer. Perhaps thoughts such as, why did I not help that child? Why did I not do anything? How can I continue to eat after witnessing such suffering? Where is God in all this? Why, why do the innocent children suffer? Life is not fair. God is not fair. These are real, everyday thoughts, logismi that afflict people inside and outside of the church. 
as we can see, the proper orthodox methodology in dealing with these tyrannical and destructive thoughts is desperately needed and can only be provided by a true interpretation of the gospel provided to us by the church fathers. As Christians of the West, we have to realize that the Christian hope, the blessed hope, is not in our material wealth, in our comfort. But the ultimate hope is the abolishment of death by the resurrection of Christ. And as much as we want to, we will not be able to feed all the hungry children and clothe all the naked people. We will not cure all diseases. We will not eliminate human suffering. This is God's work. This will take place during the second resurrection. And yes, it would be wonderful to be able to save that child and every child. No one wants to see a hungry child. But this is the result of a fallen and sinful world. However, Christ will justify these children eternally. Now, getting back to loyismi, or these thoughts, where do they come from? As we said, some of them may be from God, some are from the devil, and some are from us. Can we know where they come from? No, not always. Not always. It's very difficult. But there are some objective criteria. Normally, and if a thought tells you to do something against the will of God. And again, we know of people that have these off-the-wall thoughts. A thought will come and tell you to elbow another person, just out of the blue. And you're you thinking, am I crazy or what? Where a thought may come to tell you to jump off, you know, you're on a roof, and it just tells you, whispers you, why don't you jump off? Or jump into the street. When a thought goes against the will of God or against the commandments of God, a thought that tells you to steal or to miss church on Sunday, generally speaking, these thoughts are from the devil. They're not from God. Another way to know is that if a thought produces confusion, unrest, anxiety, stress, turmoil, darkness, this is never from God. 